Hello, everybody. It's Stefan from A Comedy Advice Podcast, here to give you a dash of entertainment while you're out there mowing that lawn in those hot summer days or those cold winter nights. I don't know when you mow the lawn, but I'm here for it, and I want to be able to help trim off some boredom while you're trimming off those blades of grass, making them hearty, healthy, and ready for a big, full lawn or football field, wherever you're mowing. But guys, I am thrilled to be able to present to you this episode with Brad Sherwood. He is an absolute treat and we have a ball, maybe except for the first part where Steph makes a rookie mistake and pronounces his last name wrong. Oh my gosh, 250 episodes and still can't get, I got cocky. That's what happened. And I just, I had the confidence. I was like, you know what? I don't even need to figure out how to pronounce Sherwood. It just popped in. And so I made a complete a dork of myself so but besides that it was an excellent time and we have a ball i hope you guys enjoy and if you do enjoy please comment like subscribe leave that tasty review hmm? finger licking good guys i love you so much thank you for all the support and i'm just gonna let you get right to the entree enough with that app here we go Woo. hello everybody and welcome to a comedy advice podcast. I'm your host, Stefan Satani, and joining me today, a very special guest. He's been appearing on Whose Line Is It Anyway for 18 seasons. He's hosted a number of game shows, including The Dating Game, Guessing on the Price is Right, and more. He's got a Zoom show with Colin Mockery called Stream of Consciousness. He loves spicy food, and his last name encourages a fair division of lumber. Everybody, please welcome Brad Sherwood. Clap, clap, clap. Thank you so much. I changed the pronunciation of my name to Sherwood uh back in the day but uh it still works for the pun oh thank you i you know i did try and force it a little bit i just didn't want you to lose a bunch of listeners when they're like he doesn't even know how to say his last name so you know it's it's like mockery people say mockery or macaquery and it's mockery so you know he gets the uh, same thing that's that's right i had him on and i called him mackerel actually colin mackerel oh I said he's not fishy yeah. but no i'm kidding but brad it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. How are you doing, first off? Uh, I am doing great, uh, doing surprisingly well. I mean, uh, the, we are, my primary income is performing live on tour in theaters. So uh, sure. there could not be an, in, uh, an occupation that has been more impacted uh, by a complete shutdown. Uh, and it'll be sort of one of the last ones that fully rebounds because it's the most dangerous setting is to put people shoulder to shoulder laughing out loud and basically having spit fly all over each other. So uh, but uh, it's been a sort of a, an interesting year of reflection and out of it grew the, the the streaming show that Colin and I came up with, which has been really a fun uh, creative endeavor. And we sort of created a show that doesn't still exist anywhere uh on mm -hmm. on the zoom platform <clears throat> oh that's really cool and i i know you and i were talking a little bit about stream of consciousness that you and colin are doing and um before i think the pandemic hit you guys were doing the scared scriptless tour where uh, it yeah. looked like doing improv based off of a lot of interaction and suggestions from the audience has that been a morph the into stream of consciousness now and an adaptation or what are the differences there well, the, the show that we are doing online is a complete departure from what we uh, do in our live show. Okay. The only thing it has in common is that we interact with audience members and we get suggestions as starting points for all the things we do so that it's totally improv and you could watch two shows in a row and mm -hmm. the content and everything we say during the shows is going to be completely different. But, uh, you know, you have to sort of make things more visual and make things uh, a little shorter for the attention span of people watching in front of their computers or on their televisions. So it's just right. a it's a totally different animal, you know, um, in our our live show, which is about a, a with, we have an intermission, but it's about a two hour show. We have two halves and uh, we bring lots of people up on stage and it's all audience interaction, but it's very it's a lot more theatrical and we're in sort of a an empty theater space. So it's sort of this magic journey of uh, going with us on a, a, a confusing roller coaster ride based on the suggestions that they give us and how we sort of yeah. dig our way out of all those troubles. Uh, you know, it's kind of like they get to watch us comedically solve the New York Times Sunday crossword puzzle on stage. Uh, 
while we tell stories. So that's that's kind of what's fun. But this this is all about it's so, it's so different. You know, we can't hear each other. We can't hear them laugh. So it's a totally different environment to do comedy uh, mm. without being able to hear the laughter as far as the energy and the timing and stuff. And, you know, mm -hmm. we had to come up with ways to put us in the same screen, which we managed to crack that nut. So it's that's been fun and creative, but you can't really compare them. I mean, anybody who's seen our live show that came to this is like, oh, well, this is completely different. Uh, because at first we were like, how do we turn this uh, live show into something on Zoom? And we didn't want to be uh, look just like everything else on Zoom, which is two people talking in two different windows and you know to do a scene when i'm sitting over here and he's sitting split screen on another thing you know it, it it's sort of like a televised uh, radio program i guess but it doesn't have the theatricality so i think zoom is great for, for especially great for podcasts to sort of uh be a way for people to see the podcast as well as hear it which i think is awesome i think that has been a real boom uh, because now everybody knows how to use Zoom and they would probably rather see a videotaped podcast than just hear it, you know, maybe when they're on the subway or whatever. Uh, right. But uh, for our show, this wasn't going to translate. So we really had to completely dissect what I call weatherman technology and turn it into mm -hmm. something magical and, and compelling. Oh, that is so cool. And yeah, I totally agree about that point too, where I was just doing audio before I think the pandemic. And then I thought, okay, well, I've got Zoom and we can just press the record button. And, uh, you know, people are actually interested in watching and viewing the different backgrounds that my guests have and, and see what they say about mine. Yeah. So, and, and the people that don't need to watch it can still listen to it, uh, the, just the audio recording. So you've right. sort of, uh, right. you know, doubled the options for them, which is great because I think before the pandemic, nobody would have probably not very many people were going to record their podcast unless it was sort of like an in-studio radio thing where someone came into the studio and we're sitting with them then i think people might watch them but you know they weren't going to get people that were calling in for a podcast to set up a camera you know that would be just too labor intensive until now right 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 Absolutely. And I wanted to go back a little bit because I know that it's you and Colin in stream of consciousness, also scared scriptless. I, I also do have to comment how much I love the cover art or the, the artwork where it's you and Colin. Colin is looking at you. You're looking straight at the screen and you've got your hand palming Colin's head like a basketball which uh <laughs> yeah they, the, when we did that photo shoot we got a lot of photos out of that and uh that was his Colin's manager uh Jeff Andrews that was his idea he was like put your hand on his head and I was like oh no one's gonna like this most of all Colin but I did it and now it's like the one we use so uh <laughs> if Colin hates that he can't blame me he has to blame his own manager which I think is hilarious <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic so that the look that colin's giving you is fairly authentic that's wonderful uh -oh. yeah 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 it's 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 derision if nothing else <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things i wanted to ask was it what it's you too throughout scared scriptless stream of consciousness i know that whose line is is it anyway for players if you will and then the host and then I, I know for a brief moment I'd heard you on other interviews talking about how when Drew Carey would bring it live and there would be maybe 10 of you um, yeah. obviously different numbers and and I wanted to ask you which numbers do you think or do you have a favorite set of numbers for doing improv because I'm imagining 10 is a lot and you get a lot of bench time Ten is a lot and four I, I mean if you look yeah. at most of the who's line several games will kind of use four people in the scene but it's kind of like starts with two then someone else comes in does their bit and then someone else comes in and does their bit or it's a group game right. where two people come to the center of the stage do things and then one leaves and one leaves. it's still really mostly a traffic pattern of two people interacting at any one time so you know colin and i've been doing our live show two-man show for 19 years and we both love that it's just the two of us on stage because really uh, the fact that you can trim it down to that is kind of fun and you don't have to sit mm -hmm. on the bench as it were at all. You know, in fact, you don't even have a time to have a moment to think because uh, the, only, the only time I, I don't have time to think because Colin says something and I literally have to react. I don't, I can't sit there and come up with something. 
you know, uh -huh. and I can't plan ahead because everything Colin says takes it off in an unknown direction from anything I might have had planned. So it's mm -hmm. really and, and and then you get a laugh. And I always say after you get a big laugh, you, you're literally back to to the dry erase board. It's kind of like that was great. Now what? You know, it's not over. You got to keep going. You got to either set something up for another laugh or or milk that and keep going, you know. It's because mm -hmm. you're not scripted. You're not like, oh, we're getting to the big funny part of the scene where all this happens. You know, you right. really, you, your last laugh is over and it is now up to to come up as quickly as possible with the next laugh. It's oh, unlike man. any other sort of art form. You know, the most, most things that you get good at, whether it's in sports or any type of art or music is uh, perfection by repetition you know, practicing scales or practicing free throws or, you know, practicing your physical form for any other type of athletic thing and mm -hmm. uh, getting good with muscle memory and brain memory. Whereas in this, in improv, you get good at it by doing it over and over again, but you're not supposed to do it the same way twice. And that's counterintuitive to everyone because people that learn stuff, if you get an education, you read and you learn and you memorize and then you do it by rote until it becomes natural. You know, there's not a surgeon that's like, hey, I'm going to do this eye surgery totally different way this time. No, you're, you have perfected the, the most efficient way to do something. So mm -hmm. it scares people, I think, uh, which is why not a lot of people are, are great at improv because it kind mm -hmm. of goes against the entire methodology that people use to get good at whatever they're doing. Hmm. That and I wanted to. I was thinking about that too as you were talking about it. And I know that you have mentioned being for improv, um, just being open and um, reactionary. So that instead of if you and I fall guilty of this too, sometimes, especially when I was listening back to some of my older episodes, um, I I thought for a second as I was editing, I don't know if I'm really listening to the guest right here. And yeah. um, I, I, it really resonated with me as I was hearing you on other interviews and, and speaking about, you know, you might have something in your back pocket, but forget mm -hmm. about everything and just react. And so yeah. it leads me to this point where I was actually, I had David Rosowski on the podcast a long time ago, and he was talking Love about- David. Oh, he's such an exceptional guy, uh, yeah, amazing person. And um, he was talking about some parallels with, meditation and improv where just being really mindful of what's going on and being able to concentrate on just what that person is saying and being able to react with the top of mind expressions or, or whatever and um i kind of wanted to ask how how are you able to practice hone that skill and and become in as in that moment as possible that was a very well long i think the key, to, the, key, the key to that is is a, trusting that you're going to say funny things throughout the performance, not have okay. a panic of like somehow this is a finite thing or I'm going to dry up and panic and, and feel desperate to grasp for something and try too hard. I trust that I have a really good sense of humor and I've been doing this for so long that it's, it's, it's a natural process. And I also mm -hmm. trust that Colin could say 20 different things and for a microsecond, I'm going to be stumped as every human being is when you're in the middle of a conversation. You, every conversation we have in life is improvised other than an interview where there's a set series of questions that you ask the question, you get the answer, you ask the question, you get the answer. And for the mm -hmm. one person who doesn't even know the answer, the questions, that's an improvised conversation as well. Uh, when you drive, you improvise, you know, because mm -hmm. something jumps in front of you, you have to sw swerve or step on the brakes. You don't know what's going to be happening in pretty much all moments of your life. You go to open a door, uh, going into Starbucks and you grab the handle and you walk in or you go to open the door and someone's coming out with a stroller so you have to move out of the way. It's your entire life is improvised. Yeah. So it's actually a brain process that everybody does all day long. But the key is that we're doing it in a way that we're processing everything in a funny way to entertain the audience. So it has a sort of a heightened extra level to just using your brain as you normally do when you hear input and then you process it and then you respond. So mm -hmm. I think the key going back to the first part of the question is yeah. you literally just have to hang on every word of the person you're on stage with, with 
and that, which is great also when you're doing an interview like this is mm -hmm. you could have six questions and you, you're like, start with the first one and you may diverge all the way along the line and not get to the other five by the end of the thing. Great. Those are there to go back to when all of a sudden there's kind of like a, a lull and okay. And your brain's going, now what? We sort of talked that out of, out of mm -hmm. you know, it being important anymore, or we, we covered the entire thing, then you can refer back to the questions. And so I always just listen to everything Colin says. And, you know, sometimes he'll say something and he'll, he'll say a word wrong. That is a moment to not ignore and carry on. If, if, if I feel like, oh, that was funny the way he said that word and he said it wrong. If I call attention to that, the audience is going to laugh because they heard him say that word wrong. So they're thinking, well, while they're watching the show, they said, oh, he said, uh, digestible wrong you know <laughs> so i if i call attention to that it's a terrible example but or, or uh, he I says sherwood that, instead of sherwood then that, that's yes, a good moment right, to call it out. right that's what everybody was going to be thinking the the moment uh you started the show like look i doesn't even know how to say his last name so uh and, and and then if i didn't say something they're like why didn't he correct him on how to say his own last name you know yeah. so uh and, and the first thing I thought of is he said my name wrong. So I was like, well, I got to say that, you know, it's, yes. it's kind of taking the filter off. Uh, and I also like to make the comparison that grown people that improvise are kind of reopening the part of their brain that they used when, when they were a little kid, when they had a stick and they used it as a gun or, a, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a, you know, a little girl was using a, a thimble and making it a princess and pretending and, and adding all of the reality to something that is very bleak and stark by its own natural properties. And so, mm -hmm. Once you sort of free that part of your brain up to go, the world is an infinite number of possibilities. And I also, when, when someone says something to you on stage, you literally have an infinite number of possibilities as your response. And I think a lot of new improvisers are like, oh, I've got to say something funny here. What is the, what is the funny thing? And having those two sentences run through your brain is already way too much time to take mm. before you have responded to it. And so yeah. there's a, sometimes an awkward pause that takes way too long between uh, newbie improvisers because they think I've got to come up with the perfect end. And by then it's tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. And even if they did yeah. come up with something perfect, it's almost disappointing the audience because they're not keeping the pace of the game mm -hmm. going. It's almost like mm -hmm. you're playing ping pong and you, he hits it to you and you hold the ball for a sec instead of hitting it back. And then you go, oh, let's start over, you know? And it's just like, no, this it's about watching a, a professionals. It's like, how fast can they do it? Oh my God. How do they yeah. do that? And you know, it's not like we're doing a magic act. We're just using our sort of open childhood brain and our years of honed comedy uh, together. And that's kind of what I, I always say. I say two things uh, that, you know, improvisers are grown people acting like kids. And I say it's uh, really smart people acting stupidly. Mm. Because you, to, to be able to access everything you, that you've ever thought of in your brain and feel like it's really, truly accessible, you have to be like you were saying, almost in a, in a meditative, instead of, a, I don't know what it is. Is it an alpha state or a beta? I don't know where you go down in meditation, which Greek letter it is. Is it a gamma state? I don't know what it is, but wherever that is, is kind of where you need to be. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not comparing myself to Michael Jordan, but uh, you know, when he's in a game and he's, you know, charging the basket and then he has an, he has three options right there as he's going in. He's like, I see Pippen. I could get it to him. Oh, mm -hmm. I, th the lane is closed. Can I still go to the bucket myself or do I just stop freeze back up and shoot the three? Like he has all those options open to him and he's micro processing it all based on all the information he's got. And, you know, that's kind of what you do as an improviser uh, when someone says something to you on stage, you know, says, uh, you know, what are you doing? Literally something that open-ended you have so many, you have an infinite number, you, you can say literally anything there, you know, and then based mm -hmm. on that, that person has an infinite number of uh, opinions or attitudes, or, you know, he can be angry at that, he can be amazed at that, he can want to help you, there's so many different things. And you have mm -hmm. to sort of uh, trust in that process that, that you're, you're going to get there. I think you have to have an innate sense of humor that uh, hopefully was there before you decided you wanted to be an improviser. 
I think it's easy to mm. teach people how to improvise, but they may not get good at improvising fast or being a particularly funny person who then has the chops to be entertaining consistently in front of an audience. I see that, you know, that's really like people that like to sing. There are people that love to sing, but they're like just a little tone off the notes. And you're like, God, you love to sing. It's kind of the same thing with certain improvisers that are like, I am so gung ho. I'm in an improv group, but most of the stuff I, I say is not particularly funny. So it's, it's kind of yeah. a double-edged sword. sword. Don't mm -hmm. worry about being funny, but at some point along the lines, uh, if you want to get to the NBA draft, you have to have made a lot of buckets for it to mm -hmm. be super audience worthy other than, you know, your friends and the people that come to see you at the, in the college uh, cafeteria, you know, at lunchtime. I say that because I have performed in the college cafeteria at lunchtime with a sketch group that I was in when I was in college. So uh, that is not in any way disparaging. <laughs> that is experiential. <laughs> oh, very interesting. And that is all, super interesting and it just reminds me i was watching a lot of clips with you and brad and i saw one where you guys did in 2011 um opened up for the just for laughs comedy festival where mm -hmm. people i remember you guys asking you're like how many of you guys still believe that some of this is made up that though or i mean it's not sorry not some of it's made up some planned of this is ahead, scripted yeah. or planned ahead yeah. and there were people that clapped and and um just looking across everywhere it's just something that some people have such a hard time wrapping their heads around because i think they just might not that they they would imagine themselves trying to do it and be terrified and they they don't think that they have the faith to to put it all in and just do some some improv because it's the only thing it's it's more like a, almost it's most it's almost like an intellectual comedy magic trick to them and every time they see magic they're like wow he made that disappear but in the back of their brain they're like well he didn't make that disappear because that's not actually possible so it's either below the table it's in his coat it's you know they may not come mm -hmm. up with what he did but they do not believe that he actually made that thing no longer anywhere near him within five feet you know and they kind of do that with us and their excuse is well they kind of get whatever the suggestion is they sort of steer that game in the direction of this and then they sort of do the, the same sort of storyline and you know that's that, that's not what we do so yeah uh, yeah in a certain sense it's like a compliment and an insult it's like i can't believe you're that talented is the insult and the compliment is I, that is so amazing that my brain will not accept that you're actually doing what you say you're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it, but it, it, it's, it's real. It's, but, but mm -hmm. this goes back to the, the practice and, and a combination of fear of being up in front of people, a fear of feeling like that most people are quick enough to, to be that quick because they can't fathom that people can actually do it. They have to find, the excuse for what it is really that they're doing. Mm. You know, if, if someone, no one says, uh, rest in God, rest his soul, Eddie Van Halen, they, none of them are saying, oh, he wasn't actually hitting all those notes in the guitar solo. He would record twice and do play it twice on a guitar to add all those notes. No, they're just like, yeah. he's amazingly that fast on a guitar. But with us, it's like, hmm, nah, there's some gimmick. There's some trap door. When when he says mailbox, then Colin will do this and be an angry plumber. You know, like like we have <laughs> an infinite number of default scenes that get us back to the one thing that we're going to do that night. Oh man! And one other thing I wanted to say too was because um, I, I had heard you talking about how you had got invited to uh, perform with a group here in Arizona at Jester's, and I'm sure that yeah, may yeah. happen with you uh, a lot. And I was thinking how important is it to have that chemistry of people you know, or even at the point where, I mean, obviously you are one of the most talented improvisers in the world and working with folks that might not be at that level, folks that you, like you may have mentioned, the, uh, uh, the maybe just one note off singers of improv might be in there. How, how are you able to still put on a good show and how important is it that everyone's at the same level? Or is it not? I don't know. Uh, well, there's sort of several schools of thought to that. First of all, yeah. uh, I think 
a, a performing group that works together and performs on a regular basis and has a, a, yeah. like a good following and a nice crowd. I think, I think uh, the camaraderie and the chemistry that they have is so crucial. It's great. Mm -hmm. and, and they all sort of get to know like what some people's strengths and weaknesses are or who are the ones that sort of have the weird obtuse brain that comes up with the crazy non sequiturs and who are the ones with the big energy that uh, can ramble on on a hilarious monologue. It's, it's mm -hmm. great to have a group that coalesces like that and, and puts on great shows. Um, and I, by the way, had a really great time uh, with Jester Z. It was such a fun thing. I'd love to go oh, back. Oh, great. Uh, yes. And uh, they were all fun and, and they all were really good. Were they all at the exact same level as each other? No, but that doesn't matter. Uh, you know, a group finds its own level and some groups are like hardcore and it's like a chorus line and they only want the five funniest people in the group of 30 people they know and that's it. And everybody else gets kicked to the curb. Uh, mm -hmm. Other groups are like, we have people coming in and out. Some people play once a month. Others are pretty much there every time. And, th and that also works. Uh, but I think as a purist of improv, uh, which is why I never worry about going and jamming with a group, is if, you if you're truly great at improv, you should be able to work with someone that doesn't even do improv. In fact, lots of times on stage in our live show, Colin and I, bring audience members up and then they're sort of finishing our sentences and or adding plot points and information that then we have to repeat as our dialogue. So you're literally improvising with someone that's not an improviser and then you're turning what they say into the content of the show. So it's, it's basically, if you look, I'm, they used to call me Mr. Analogy in college, but if you look almost at improv as like a martial art, it's like mm -hmm. you get really good at, let's say, karate or judo, and you learn all the forms and everything you do, what to do when someone attacks you and how to throw their weight and then, mm. you know, go on on the attack. But in real life, using your judo, you're not going to be across from your instructor who's just going to do the same things. That right. crazy person's got a pipe and they're coming at you and trying to kick you and do things that's not kosher in judo so yeah. you have to be good at getting anything thrown at you and as an improviser there's technically no difference between what colin would be throwing at me because i haven't heard it i don't know what it is and a statement that we get from an audience member that's nervous and up on stage which is going to be my next line of dialogue mm. it's still unknown to me and however obtuse or boring or or uh nervous that thing is that they said I have to use it because it's just been heard by the audience and I, and it, I don't need to judge it. I instantly go, what's funny about this? Is it the way they said it? Is it, and this is happening in, you know, micro microseconds. Is it the t content of what they said, the way they said it, uh, whatever. And then I repeat it. And then I now have to create the reality and the history of why my character says that and believes it mm -hmm. and just, Start making stuff up, which is really all improv is, is committing to making things up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you had mentioned doing improv in college, cafeterias at lunchtime, which obviously led to further and greater things. In college, you had gotten an acting degree and actually got hired to be part of a Shakespearean play. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I went to a Shakespearean repertory company. My my uh, college was in Ohio, and okay, yeah. uh, I, I got hired uh, for the next season by a Shakespearean rep company up in Wisconsin. So I literally, I didn't even get to stay for my uh, college graduation because their season started. Uh, so I had to leave when I was done with school, drove up there in my little Carmen Ghia with my, all of my belongings and lived there from whatever, you know, beginning of summer all the way through November of that year uh, doing outdoor seasonal uh, Shakespeare in a, it, not quite in the round but it was a th outdoor thrust stage so in the summer mm -hmm. we were you know swatting mosquitoes off of us in the middle of a monologue and, <laughs> and in the and in the winter we were wearing long underwear under our uh, clothes <laughs> I, you know I, I had a very small parts in everything so I did a lot of you know spear carrying in the background freezing uh -huh. uh in the early days of November. So, oh man, Wisconsin. 
Oh my gosh. Is that what you had wanted to do with your degree or did when you started seeing improv and started to do that, did you want to go in the comedy or, or improv direction and kind of how did well, you I first go yeah, ahead? Yeah. I first saw improv. Uh, I saw a three man group uh, perform at some weird place. It was like a restaurant or a coffee house while I was in college with a bunch of friends of mine and we were doing sketch comedy at the time. So we, we did a little improv ourselves to like write the sketches but mm -hmm. I had never seen improv performed uh, as an actual standalone art form. And I mm -hmm. saw them and I was amazed. I thought, this is amazing. Wow, I, I love this. I want to do this someday. And, but I didn't really give it much more thought because I was in college and just had to mm -hmm. graduate. And I thought, well, I'm going to be an actor. And then when I graduate, my di direction will be, do I want to go into theater and work my way to New York to do Broadway? Or do I want to go into TV and movies and work my way west and go to Los Angeles? Uh, so the improv part kind of didn't come along till a couple of years. I was working in TV production behind the scenes uh, while I went on auditions. And, and uh, a guy I was working with who just thought I was funny and clever said, I'm mm -hmm. taking this improv workshop. It's, it's an improv class. We meet once a week. Would you like to go check it out? And so I went and checked it out and it was like the clouds parted and the golden sun rays came down and was like, this was what you were meant to. It was like uh, in the Lion King, I was the little cub that was held up to the sun. Uh, <laughs> I, I finally found my calling. Like, this is what I want to do. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I want to do it. And then just uh -huh. was performing five nights a week in like three different groups. I was in Second City. I was in theater sports in Los Angeles and just kept going and going and going. And then luckily, Whose Line came along, which was the only location for someone to actually make money on television doing improv, came along right at the right time uh, in yeah. my career. And then that just sort of paved the way for everything else. That's really cool. I saw a couple of videos of, um, I think it was your time in Second City. I saw the ad guys with you and Steve Carell, which was yeah. pretty awesome to see. I, you don't look like you've aged that much either. So I think. It was oh, you're very kind. You're very kind. <laughs> yes. No, I, I looked very, very young, as did Steve. Yeah, that we, we only shot the pilot. Sadly, we got one pilot. Uh, and then uh, I think we it was for Ha Television. And then that that disband and the the the. Sh the shrapnel of those two things became Comedy Central, but you know, mm. no one wants to take an old pilot from a non-existent network and and uh, oh. repackage it. So it was just a horrible, one of those horrible timing moments where something that could have been great because Steve mm. was in it, Ryan was in it. Actually, yeah. uh, Colin told me not long ago that he was supposed to be Steve's uh, part, but for some reason he couldn't do it. It was a Canada thing, getting in time and whatever. So they brought Steve Carell in uh, for his part in that show. Huh. But I mean, luckily for Colin, it didn't do anything but one, you know, one <laughs> right. pilot episode, but still it was kind of surreal. And this was before I knew Colin. I knew Ryan because I was in the uh, touring company at Second City out in Los Angeles at the time, and he was in the main company. And mm -hmm. uh, I was his understudy. So I've, <laughs> I've known Ryan a long time. That's really cool. And was he the one that told you about the Who's Line auditions? Or how did you find out about it? Yeah, oh, okay. he, he did. Okay. He said the he said, Ryan told me he said the producer uh, of Who's Line was coming to town. He'd already done, I think, three seasons of it. And, and mm -hmm. Greg had also done, uh, I think, three or four. I think he was on before Ryan even. And mm -hmm. they were coming to town to look for people. Uh, partly because they were going to shoot this season in New York City. So it was going to be Whose Line Comes to America. And the whole production crew had come to the United States to shoot it. Uh, so they thought, let's let's uh, plumb the depths of the U.S. talent because we mostly had, mostly they had uh, British talent, except for Mike McShane and Greg and Ryan. And I mm -hmm. think Colin had done one season at that point. And I auditioned mm -hmm. and got on and then kind of kept going. Uh, but it's you always feel like you're auditioning for the next season every season you do this show there's no like no one really has squatters rights on anything except for uh wayne and colin and ryan the the That's four chairs are always like da, 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 da. 
That's really funny. Uh, when I spoke with Colin, he was telling me in the UK version, he felt yeah. the same way. And he felt at the point where I think they were saying, you're going to get two episodes and then we'll see after that. And then he ended up keep, yeah. keep going on. Uh, one of the other things he told me about was the audition. Was it like eight in the morning? Was it the same for you? Was it like an early morning audition? Cause that doesn't seem yeah. like the right time was, for comedy. It was, it was brutal. It was an early morning audition and it went well into the mid afternoon. And it was kind of like a chorus line where it starts off with a huge cast. And then every few minutes they go, you three, step four, thank you. You know, like, they didn't make them step forward, but they just literally listed who could stay through the next round. And it just got smaller and smaller. And nothing says be funny, like uh, <laughs> the fear of being cut. And not like anybody's doing their best improv when they're when everybody's panicking and trying desperately to get their funny line in before they're cut, you know? So you've got <laughs> three people in a scene and they're all just like, <laughs> you know, and it's just oh good luck God. with that. Oh yeah, my god! I, I lucked out uh, and was on the money that day. But the the, sad, the awful thing was, I knew everybody in that audition because the improv world is pretty small. So that whole audition group was some Second City people, a lot of theater sports people, a bunch of groundlings, and um, uh, LA a couple of LA Connection people, which were I think pretty much the only groups that were there at this time. And it was kind of like, it was so fun because, oh, I'm, I'm getting to improvise with people I know, some of which I've never improvised with before, but at least I know. And then like, mm -hmm. we're having a great scene and like, ah, I mean, we both go sit down for the next two people to go up and we're like feeling pretty good. And then they ask him to leave and it's like, oh, all right, bye. And it just, you know, oh, no. so, yeah. what, was it like they let you finish the scene or was it like freeze you three? Oh no, they, yeah, they would, they would, yeah. They never kick someone out literally after a scene but it was like they would do a round of scenes or they'd play right. a certain game and they'd have five get up for it and then another five and then the yeah. last five or however many were there so everybody kind of got a chance to do some of the the signature games from the show uh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you know some people might have said one or two things and <laughs> it just wasn't funny and like that was it like trial by absolute firing squad oh man I can't. Yeah. Ah, that's, there, there was I, a, there was a guy uh, that I, I, because they were looking in other places too. Uh, the, uh -huh. the season that I came on the show, the first season, we had a morning. Uh, I don't know if it was a day, it was a day before we'd all gotten into New York and the producers mm -hmm. wanted us to sort of get in a little rehearsal space and kind of go through the games with the, mm -hmm. with the group of people um, mm -hmm. Who were going to be in the show and it was obviously colin and ryan and greg and i were there and uh, i think mike mcshane was there and a couple of other people uh, a bunch of a couple other newbies like me and mm -hmm. they just had us running through the games and it's it, it was like eight in the morning something like that none of them were just sipping our coffee and we're just, we just think we're sort of marking through so the producers can sort of teach us what the structure of those games are and you know so none of us were taking it too terribly seriously and uh, then after the rehearsal, uh, they pulled one guy aside and sent him home like he wasn't going to make it on the show. And we had all been told we were going to be doing the show. And he was sent back. But make, to make it worse, he had flown in from Australia. So he was an Australian improviser who had come in and just had this groggy morning, what he thought was marking through the games uh not needing to be on as it were and actually be super funny the whole time luckily i was at the age where i was always trying to be really super funny so i was in my early 20s so like i'm i was always on and i never missed a chance to take a bite at the apple but yeah. you know in my later days i might have just been like yeah we know i know this game we're, we're fine yeah yeah i'll say something funny and then he says something you know and i wouldn't have gotten oh, on the show God. Yeah, oh so like it, the wolves are at the door at all times. It's a uh, it's a blood sport. Oh man, I would have yeah, I would have been devastated. I would have already had my Christmas cards out with like, hey, just got the job. Yeah, with the logo, season. like, see me yeah. soon on season eight of <laughs> Who's Line UK. Yeah, yeah, it was. Oh my god, that that is crazy. And 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 one of the things that you were just talking about too was like the producers talking about the structure of the show. Um, I wanted to ask just a little bit about, I know improv is very unstructured and you make it up as you go. Mm -hmm. that, that kind of seems like it goes against 
what TV producers try and do where they try and have some sort of structure and they try to have the type of things where they kind of know what can happen for maybe censorship reasons or things like that. Were there ever any, um, I'm sure maybe less on the UK side, but like, were there ever any struggles with producers or with just like creativity of, oh, we're just improving here. And they say, oh, no, you can't do that. Or you have to do it this way. Or... I tended not to do that because I knew I was a fourth chair always. So ah, okay. <laughs> like I just showed up and uh, delivered hors d'oeuvres wherever I needed to go at any time. <laughs> My job was certainly temporary uh, at any given moment. Uh, so, yes, I was never going to be like, this structure sucks. Uh, I can leave that to the, the regular guys. Uh, but uh Yes, it, it was it was hard for them to sell the show because mm -hmm. the producers don't have sort of as much control of this as they do in every other form of of television production. You know, everything is scripted. It's been written by committee. It's been approved by the censors. It's been approved by the executive producers and the network. Everything that's going to happen has been seen in advance by all those people, at least in on hard paper. And this mm -hmm. is just like, well, four guys are going to get up there. They're going to play a game called this and we'll see what happens. So they lo lose all control and they're, they're just sort of the producer's pitch is kind of like, trust us, they're funny. And <laughs> then nobody <laughs> wants to, to do that. So it took a long time. I mean, it was on it was on in England, I think, for maybe 10, nine or 10 years before it transferred over to uh ABC and it really only got on because of Ryan's relationship with Drew you know because they were working mm -hmm. together on the Drew Carey show and he's like I wish we could get the show on on the on the network here uh, and so Drew used his clout I think to walk into ABC and say guys you got to give this a chance and they were like mm, all right we'll give you six episodes in the summer that's it and if people like it will think about it like that was it and you know it, it got amazing ratings in the summer and then it, it danced around the time slots uh and and it did great whenever it was like on a monday or a wednesday night and then they finally because it was such an affordable show it, the production costs one set four people uh and a, and a camera crew were so low compared to all their scripted stuff you know mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. uh we eventually settled at eight p.m. I think it was 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. on a Thursday night but we were opposite of Friends and Seinfeld and Survivor yeah. you know it was like the death of us to go up against the like the juggernauts of shows uh, so then they look at the ratings and be like oh the ratings aren't so good and I, I just wanted to scream. Yeah, the ratings aren't good because you thought our show is super cheap. So you could put us in a dangerous spot where you wouldn't be losing any money. But if you put us in a, a good spot where we could actually be competitive in the ratings, not up against the three shows that are going into the TV Hall of Fame, uh, then, you know, <laughs> we might we might have a chance. So that was that's always the, the nature. There's so many reasons that uh, good shows either struggle or, or go through the ups and downs and, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, but it, doing the show has allowed me and Colin to go for almost 19 years touring live, which has been so fun. Like, it's so fun. Wow. It never gets boring. The travel gets boring. The hotels get boring. But being on stage and doing the show uh, year after year is a blast because every night when we walk, we sort of look at each other right before we go on stage and we go, I can't believe we get to do this, you know, it's, it, and we don't have any idea what we're going to do. We have a little menu of this is our game set for the night. Right. So we know, so we, it's our running order. So we know to set up that game and this and that, but the content mm -hmm. of the game is going to be completely different. In one sound effects scene, we're plumbers and the next one, we're going to be ghostbusters, you know? So it's not like, Oh yeah, we get to always revert back to the plumber story. No, we don't. And the next one we're Vikings yeah. and we're stuck on a fjord somewhere. And so, so it's, <laughs> That's that's what makes it, it fun is that, you know, there's no uh, second night blues like there is in a, mm -hmm. in a Broadway show. And then those people start to have to force themselves to stay alert because they've done this song a million times and they might start thinking about their groceries or the fact that their dog is sick while they're in the middle of a song that they've done, you know, eight times a week. Uh, for mm -hmm. six years.
Mm. And it's always different with us. So we can't, we can't tune out because I have to hang on every word that Colin says at all times. Like that, like you have to be so connected, which is why it's still so exciting for us. You think, well, how can they still like doing this show? Well, because we have no choice but to be so excited. Like it's the first time we've done it because every night really is the first time we're going to say all these sentences that are coming out of our mouth and they have to be inspired and they have to make sense based on what is going on in the show and they have to be funny. Amazing. That is so cool. Do, do you have any favorite games that you guys play or do you just like it all? Yeah, I like, there's a game we added not uh, about five years ago called Song Q, which I love. Okay. And we've got a bunch of different instrumental songs, like songs that people know, you know, like uh, yeah. uh, Crocodile Rock from Elton John or uh, Dancing Queen from ABBA, like just a bunch of songs from all over the board from like the 60s on up to present day. And uh, our tour manager has them on an iPad and she has a list. We may do like eight songs in any one performance, but she has a list of like 40. So we never know what song's gonna come out. So it's, it's kind of like Russian roulette blind. What song <laughs> is gonna be foisted upon me? And, you know, it could be me, it could be Colin, whatever. So we start doing a scene and uh, we get suggestion from the audience and we're, we're building a scene. And then at any time after Colin says anything, I can say, what do you mean? And that is her cue to hit the music. And then he has to sing basically whatever it was that he said back then. He's like, well, you haven't lived till you've tried walrus. And I go, what do you mean? And he used to sing a song that's about <laughs> why walrus is so delicious and nutritious and blah, 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 blah. And he has to sing it to Jailhouse Rock by uh, Elvis, <laughs> you know? So we're really, we're really doing this uh, at the same time. And that never gets old because the song, you know, you might not do the same song once in three or four shows. And then another song uh -huh. you might get five times in a row. So uh <laughs> Cause it's just, it's so random, but you're trying to rhyme, you're trying to sing and you're trying to make sense and make them laugh. So I like that because it's, it's kind of about as hard as it gets to be good and still be funny. Mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. that's, that's probably my favorite game. That is so cool. Oh man. I'm just thinking about all the games that, that I, I saw on all the shows and one that I didn't see, I think it was back when you were talking about when you guys were doing the live performances with 10 people, there was a rat trap game that you all blindfolded yourselves yes it's called yeah it's called mouse traps and uh, oh, I'm two sorry. people yeah two two people uh, unlucky people uh have to do that game generally in, in the big group that we did uh, vegas with and uh I, I i had done that a couple times when i was in theater sports on a couple different shows and so i pitched it to the gang and i said what is, does anybody like this idea we get 100 mouse traps and they're already looking at me like what is wrong with you and and then two people are blindfolded and they have to do a scene. And I think it was the alphabet scene. So they, they would have to, I don't know if we did it the alphabet, but they had to just do improvise a scene while they're barefoot walking around blindfolded in this minefield of mouse traps. And so they'd be in the middle of a sentence and they'd step on one. And so it's like, well, I've got to leave. I've got to go to the, ah, and then scream, you know? So, and the audience loves it. Like little kids, they're just howling like from a different part of their brain at seeing someone else's pain. In, in a, in, it's totally, and it's such a schlocky game because it's just a, a right. sight, it's a painful sight gag that really doesn't have anything to do with improv, but it was such right. a crowd pleaser that uh, we did it in, in the Vegas shows. And then Colin and I continued to do it for many years in our, uh, our two-man show, but we, we since have uh, hung up our mousetraps because as purists we're like we, you know we know the audience loves it but so many people that have seen us many times have seen it so many times and it's of all the things we do it's the least improv because it's such a, a gimmick so we kind of yeah. said you know we'll 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 bring this back for like the 30-year reunion tour uh, <laughs> but but for now it's like no oh, and man. sometimes they really hurt when they when it closes just like on the knuckle or the nail of one of your toes all by itself if it goes off on the side of your foot it doesn't really hurt uh -huh. Lots of times you'd step straight down and it would be completely under your foot. So it wouldn't go off until you lifted it back up. Oh, 
So, so, but, but when it does that, it goes off, on, but without hitting you. So what I'm saying is if you, if you oh, manage to I cleanly see. step on it, so you know, it's going to go off when you lift your foot. So you just lift it quickly and it still makes a big sound and you're scared and the audience thinks it's hurting you, but it doesn't. Oh, gotcha. But one time gotcha. I did that and I stepped on it and I slowly lifted my uh, foot back up, but not all the way. And the little arm mechanism that locks it into place stood straight up and was wedged against the bottom of my foot and I didn't know it. And then I started to put my weight back on it. <laughs> oh no. It went about, yeah, it went about a, a quarter or a half an inch into, into the sole of my foot. And I was like, oh man. So yeah, I would say there'd been a handful of shows where we did the last part of the show with someone having blood on their toes or foot somewhere. Oh my but gosh. <laughs> you had so much adrenaline that it didn't really matter at the time, except when it went straight on the knuckle of a small toe or, or the actual nail. That was blinding pain. Oh my God. Yeah, I can imagine. Jeez. I would hate to see your guys' toes now with the battle scars. That's oh, nice. mine are beautiful. My, my toes are fine. <laughs> I, I'm not a sandals person, so my, my feet are almost always kept in, in lovely, constantly clean socks. So I have baby soft feet. Fun oh, fact. I, I don't have those like the, the people that live in Florida that are always in flip flops and then the backs of their heels start to just like uh, they, they get dry and they get cracked. And, you know, it, my feet are always in a in a moisture controlled uh, <laughs> enclosed environment. <laughs> so they're pale. They, they look like the underbelly of a blue whale. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but they are super soft. So I could actually have my feet in a in like a foot cream commercial and say, this is the beautiful foot you're looking for. Oh my God. Well, you know what? Now I can't wait to see those feet. 30 were, you're yeah, right. You guys can oh, show they're them just, off. yeah. <laughs> that the is heels so are it's, just it's, beautiful and supple like a baby's heel. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I grew up and I'm still in Arizona, actually. And so I remember my mom. And it's so dry here that the her the heel of the foot, it's exactly like you're talking about. You could see little cracks streaming up, and I was ever fearful. So I would be a, a sock wearer. And by golly, I've still got those supple, pristine heels. It's wonderful. Yeah, that's, so. it's, you know, I'm sure people list, still listening to this are just amazed <laughs> at where this has gone. Uh, but yes, <laughs> I guess I've always had a, I always had a phobia of, uh, I used to bite my nails, but I think it was because I had seen mechanics and stuff with the dirt under their nails. So I became sort of obsessed with never having dirt under my nails. And then, so I bit my nails for the longest time, but now I just sort of continue to groom them and manicure them because I can't stand having dirt under my nails. And the, the, the dried heel feet is also a, a similar one of my own personal uh, phobias. That, that is too funny because I went to college my first year, I was going to do classical guitar. So I had to grow these three nails out for oh, doing some arpeggio picking sequence yeah 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 i hate i couldn't stand it and so now i try and keep them nice and tight and yeah. uh it, because I, I i still remember that feeling of just those long nails whenever i'd be on a keyboard yeah. I, I used to like to rock climb so i'd have to just do it with the pinky for that one oh, hand yeah. and it was just it was it was bad but anyway, getting, getting, damn you yeah. arpeggio. If only I trimmed my nails. <laughs> when I fell, you could see the claw marks going down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, that, that, that would be a big, that's, uh, I will never play classical guitar now for that very same reason. Cause yeah, I, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the guys. I don't know. I, I say guys generically, uh, uh -huh. but every once in a while you'll see a, a, a grown man with like a really long pinky nail. And I don't know what that is. I don't know if people are still doing cocaine or whether that's <laughs> like a cultural thing, but it just freaks me out to see that. It's like, I, agree. It, it, I don't know. It's, 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 it, it to me, it's the mullet. Uh, it's no, no, it's actually the worst. I was going to say it's the mullet of uh, manicuring is to have that one nail, but it, it's way worse than a mullet because mullets have their own fun charm uh, that that just is like super creeper creeper. Like it's like they got one acrylic nail and it's like, why are you using that? And it's so unsettling. I agree. You know, mullet is pretty perfect because it's like business in the front and yeah. the party in the back, but just so much more repulsive. I thought maybe it was to get better cell service. I thought maybe at first, but yeah. I really don't 
unless it's drug related the pinky yeah nails. it feels like it's their portable coke spoon i think oh, i don't know <laughs> or maybe they're chefs and they like i just need a little cumin <laughs> you know <laughs> Oh. Tarragon. I don't know. That's like the, yeah, they should have a little word for it. The pinch, a nail's worth. Ugh, I don't know if I would eat that meal. A but. Coke dealer's nail's worth of <laughs> saffron. A CDW in the chef world, yeah. the Coke dealer's worth. Uh, well, um, we are about to wind down with, uh, we actually have two questions from the Reddit advice column. This is a comedy advice podcast, so we'll give a little bit of advice. These are from real users, actually. And then we will bid each other adieu and get back on the right tender heeled feet. But um, this first question, it is, uh, it says, I have multiple alarm clocks, but I'm a major snoozy boy. I've never been a morning person, but now I'll hit snooze and get back in bed for three to five hours after the first alarm goes off. It doesn't matter what time they're set for, and every day gets later and later. I woke up at 5 p.m. today. I have four different alarm clocks, two phones, a standard alarm clock, and a sunrise mim mimicking alarm clock. Uh, any advice for getting up early? Who? Well, I think, first of all, they have... Oh, geez. Stop that. All right. Is that the I alarm think clock? They have... Yeah, it's my alarm. <laughs> I got to get up. Uh, whoever that Reddit uh, user is, they have to just finally come to terms with the fact that they are, in fact, a vampire and uh, stop fighting. <laughs> uh, that's first and foremost. And then get a great job as a night security guard. That was my first job when I moved to L.A. I worked from uh, midnight till eight in the morning. And oh. uh, yeah, just just move your clock to the time that's convenient for you to get up and uh, ditch all those other alarm clocks. Or you could set one of your alarm clocks uh, to release a bucket of ice water that you have placed above your bed in the morning. You could put it there the night before, so it might not be ice water by the time you're done with it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in the morning, you're probably not gonna hit snooze when you are doused with a frigid bucket of water on your head. So those are my two. One's a sort of existential offer and one's a practical offer on how to get up. Oh, that is excellent. I, I love that. Not at all alarming in a good way. Let's move on to the second question. Last question. It says, I think I'm starting to go insane with my cosplays and my identity. As a cosplayer who lives by herself, I make a cosplay whenever I feel like it. It's like as if I melt into that perfect form when I dress as a character. However, pretending to be many characters that I am not is starting to get me in an identity crisis. Can you please help me? That's it. <laughs> Uh, that's the question. Wow. Uh, I think if this person, he or she, uh, has an alarm clock costume, they could get together with the vampire and every day they'd have a purpose to wear the costume and their, their neuroses, which seem very similar, obsessive and yet self-aware and worried about it's a problem. Mm. And I think if mm. the two of them get together, then uh, the cosplay alarm clock uh, can wake up the angry recalcitrant vampire first thing in the morning and uh, or first thing in the afternoon oh there and, we go uh, i don't know there was a very similar vibe to both of those questions they they were very sort of self-aware and acutely troubled by their own behaviors uh, yeah i don't think there's anything wrong with sleeping in or cosplay i love cosplay uh, I think more people should cosplay on the New York subway. It would make it so much more enjoyable, except, you know, obviously oh. when there's like a Comic-Con, the, the subway is full of it. But I think on a regular basis, it'd be fun if there was like some game similar to uh, Pokemon Go, where it's like your subway bingo card. And over the course of a month, if you get the dragon and the Viking and uh, Jigglypuff, and my little pony on your and you have to like take a, a screenshot of it with your card and the date and time and that shows that you were literally on the uh, subway and then there's like the, the new york city subway gives you some sort of bonus if you've managed to get all of them on your card within say it's a week or a month i i think that's a brilliant idea and i think similar to jury duty there should be cosplay duty so that you oh. get a summons to be wolverine on the L train so that um, people can get that bingo card going. And so you I are so onto something there. Seriously, if you don't think the juries would be full if they said uh, this month is Game of Thrones jury duty, you know how many people <laughs> would go do jury duty just to put on their like 
crazy, you know, people from the North and white Walker gear, they'd sit there for hours. And then in the jury deliberation, they could all hang out. It'd be fun social time. They would, oh. it, that would, and you could, you could totally just have nothing but cosplayers be the juries from now on. It's fun. They'd get out, especially the ones like the reader, the Reddit uh, person who contributed says she never leaves the house or he never leaves the house. And I, I don't know. I think, I think you've stumbled on something there, Stephen. That would be, that would be pretty cool. And then, I mean, if you got like Sesame street or Muppets, then when you're like, the uh, jury finds you guilty of murder, then you'd be like, I can't even be mad. You, Kermit just told right? me I'm guilty of murder. Okay, so, it could have been like, worse, but uh, you know, it's not easy being green. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm thinking of his problems now. So amazing. Thank you, Brad, so much. We've reached the end My of the pleasure. podcast. And uh, yeah, you've been an absolute blast to speak with. And uh, thank you thank so you. much for My being pleasure. forgiving me. And thank you for being forgiving of me for uh, butchering your name. So I really appreciate that. I'm going to give you one chance as you sign off to say it right. Here we go. Oh, Sherwood. Brad Perfect. Sherwood. Nailed it. Okay, nailed it. Nailed it. And Brad Sherwood, where can people find you? What, what have you got to plug? Um, what have you got going on? Well, my uh, Twitter and Instagram are at the Brad Sherwood. And uh, they can find Colin and Brad, our, our tour on uh, Colin and, Bra Colin and Brad Show dot com uh, for our upcoming tours. We've got a lot of stuff starting in uh, late summer, going through the fall and into the winter. Uh, so hopefully we're coming to a town near you. And uh, I also have bradsherwood.com where I talk about when sometimes I do uh, my solo show at comedy clubs. That's also improv, but I don't do that till I see what the Colin and Brad tour looks like. And then if I have big mm -hmm. open spaces, I then uh, go that way. So oh. that's about it. I don't, I'm not much in the self-promotion. Uh, I just, I'd rather just talk and have fun, interesting conversations. But yes, please follow me on Twitter uh, because that's completely connected to my self-esteem. <laughs> and I don't have a blue check. I'm not verified. It's a crime of the century. Uh, yeah. Can you believe Shame. it? Shame. Yeah, they closed that verified door right when I was starting to really get on Twitter going. And everybody else on whose line has Twitter. So there you go. Somebody oh, wants man. to start a giant campaign to force them to put me on so be it all right well the links of the, of the socials are going to be in the show notes and a link to that campaign ladies and gentlemen is also going to be in the show Excellent. notes so let's get brad verified that, that um, could be a, a reddit conversation i think finally oh, there we go love it all right well thank you so much brad thank you listeners Pleasure. that have made it this far and uh we'll talk later oh, anyway. i talk a lot thanks everybody and that's the episode, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed. What a delicious episode for me. I'm full. I'm satiated. I hope you guys are too. No, actually, I hope you're hungry for more. And if you are, satiate that appetite by going on over, clicking on the links in the show notes to follow Brad on Twitter, Instagram, get him verified, and um, go to one of the shows, uh, the virtual shows with him, Stream of Consciousness and Colin Mockery, and uh, pay, stay tuned. Stay tuned for those live shows that might be coming to a city near you. And while you're at it, click on them links to support me. Follow me on Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, and say hi. And say hi to Brad, too. Tell him you love the episode. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Bye.